Hello and welcome to Beyond Japan, an interdisciplinary podcast that looks at the broad reach of Japanese studies from within and beyond Japan. This podcast is brought to you by the Center for Japanese Studies at the Sainsbury Institutes for the Study of Japanese Arts and Cultures, in collaboration with the University of East Anglia. I'm your host, Oliver Moxon, Project Support Officer at the Sainsbury Institutes and researcher of Japanese war heritage. This week we're joined by Professor Nicole Ruminier, Research Director at the Sainsbury Institute and Professor of Japanese Arts at UEA, to discuss Exhibiting Japan. Nicole has curated multiple exhibits at the British Museum, including their permanent Mitsubishi Gallery, as well as temporary exhibits such as the Manga Exhibit and Crafting Beauty in Modern Japan Exhibit. As we gear up to a summer of Japan-related exhibits at the Sainsbury Centre, this episode explores the challenges of presenting another nation's culture, both ethical and practical. We hope you enjoy the show. Good afternoon, Nicole. Thank you for joining me on the podcast today. Well, thank you for having me, Ali. So first of all, we'd like to know a bit more about you. Can you tell us about your area of expertise and how your interests have brought you there? Well, it's been a bit of a long journey and it's still ongoing, but um, I started off interested and, and studying archaeology and um, my undergraduate was on actually Jomon uh, archaeology and looking at the Omori uh, shell middens and um, Edward Sylvester Morse's shell middens um, reports uh, at, at Otaku in, outside of Tokyo. And it, it's, it digressed from there, but um, I, I always have had a very, very strong interest in material culture and in particular archeology span and in objects, 3D objects. And uh, I decided I did my MA in, um, history and, and in language, I wanted to learn more Japanese language and, um, and about the history and, and look at Korea and also China. And then I did my PhD, I switched departments and did it in what was then known as the Fine Arts Department at Harvard. And um, it's now changed, but it was then the Fine Arts and I asked the professor, John Rosenfield, if I could do my PhD on Japanese ceramics. And he said, ceramics belong in the kitchen or under the bed. That's what his <laughs> professor, Benjamin Rowland, had taught him. But what was interesting to me was that was such an important comment to me about the deprivileging of certain objects and certain classifications and what are classifications? What is art? What is fine art? What is material culture? It, it just, it really made it gel and it caused a fire in me to always explore what we're talking about in this kind of world around us of objects. So my focus was then and still is objects and looking at them in different perspectives, trying to kind of dig beyond what is there. And anyone who does archaeology knows this, that when you dig up something, and I've always worked on particularly historic archaeology, when you dig up something, it's different than what is in the material record there is a different history. And I realized that histories and understandings are plural. So what I think is so exciting about what I'm doing now and what I have been doing is always kind of challenging that in different angles and different aspects. And what the Sainsbury Institute is doing is looking at arts and cultures in plural from different perspectives, not a strict art history perspective. So that is my focus, but my individual passion is koge, craft, ceramic still from Jomon all the way to contemporary. And I love, love, love popular culture, particularly manga and growingly anime and those kinds of forms of mass popular culture. Fascinating. It's a very broad area of expertise there. <laughs> well, I don't know, to be honest, can I just say that I don't know what my, I, I can say that my expertise is in ceramic you know, because that's what I've done my whole life. And, sure. and you know, Japanese ceramics and trade ceramics, particularly porcelain, but I, I'm still learning about so much more. So I don't know whether I have expertise in manga, but I have a passion and interest to learn. And that's what I'm continuing to do, kind of learning on the job. Great. Well, let's look at your experience in curatorship. So starting with your curatorship of the Mitsubishi Corporation Japan Gallery at the British Museum. The British Museum attracts millions of people from around the world in an ordinary year, many of whom will be experiencing Japanese culture for the first time in the Japan Gallery. 
As the curator, where do you begin in planning an exhibit for such a wide audience, and how does the collection available lend itself to your goals? Ali, those are excellent questions. And just the fact that you're asking them shows that you're looking at things in the round. And that's exactly what the British Museum aims to do, is not just have a single palette that's out there, but just to constantly reevaluate and relook and replan. But there are many challenges that one has in a museum that viewers are sometimes not aware. There are financial challenges, there's administrative challenges, there is also planning challenges when you change something in a gallery. Well, you think, oh, it's a curator choosing something and then plopping it in there, but it's much more than that because there is a text that needs to be written that in the British Museum, that text then goes to the interpretation department because they're looking at texts throughout the museum to unify them. So it has to be molded in a certain way. And then it's a whole dialogue between the interpretation officer and the curator coming towards an understanding of what that text should be in a very, very small package because words are limited. So it's a whole kind of a process that goes on. And even recently, what stands are used in the display, and there's kind of a unification of stands. Now, there are different fads that happen in museums, but I think the British Museum, certainly in the last, since I was involved in it, you know, over 15 years, was looking at a kind of a more unified approach towards all cultures so that there can be a gold standard for the visitor to feel comfortable with. So... What that means in the vis-a-vis -vis the Mitsubishi Corporation Japanese galleries is that there was a gallery space and I was first involved in the first permanent exhibition, which we opened in 2006. Before that, the Japanese galleries had only been kind of a rotating gallery for special exhibitions because of the nature of Japanese art and having it rather fugitive. And you don't want to expose a lot of the art, not so much ceramics, but painting, prints, obviously textiles. So... Up to then, it had been a, a special exhibition gallery, but then it was created in 2006, very much with Tim Clark at the helm, looking at a permanent gallery. So permanently having Japan on display, which is incredibly exciting. And so I was doing the 3D works and Tim was overseeing the whole thing, but it was looking very much at what an average viewer would be. And when you look at the viewer demographics at the British Museum, English is not necessarily a first language for many visitors. And a large number of these visitors are foreign. The demographics change all the time. And obviously with the pandemic, it's it shifted a bit, but you would get a lot of first time foreign visitors and, and growing numbers of Chinese, um, different, you know, from actually quite far away. So the label copy and the way you introduce Japan has to take into effect that people might not be familiar at all. Like you mentioned, this is their first encounter with Japan. And so doing that, working with the interpretation department, Tim, in consultation with me and other people, created a series of stories. And so the idea is Japan is not a unified approach. It, it is a series of stories that are based in specific key objects. Um, then they were called pebbles. Um, and, you know, but the idea is that you go to the object, you have a coding, there's a very complicated formula, but it's all based on visitor experience. And the, the person would be drawn to that object, they'd see a close up picture of that object, they get the general framework, and then they could zoom in on the object with a description of that object. So through these stories, the visitor would experience everything from prehistory to contemporary Japan. This was retweaked when it became the Mitsubishi Corporation Japanese Galleries. And then most recently, very excitingly, when it was redone, there was a refurbishment in 2018, which I was involved in again, re-looking, refreshing, and revisiting. And I think now it's really got a, a great um, rhythm to it. I'm sure it'll change now and there are new people in the um, Japanese section, Asi Asian department. But the key takeaways are in the last reiteration of these permanent galleries are that the objects, certain objects are rotating, certain objects are there for longer periods of time, depending on obviously their preservation and conservation concerns. But the idea is to experience Japan in the present and then go back to the past. So we're looking in our minds at the present day. So we go in, 
We have the tea house. We have the experience of the tea house in a, in a little video that is contemporary, kind of contemplative. And there's a whole science to how long these videos can be and how the subtitles have to be white on black. Anyway, there's all of these kind of things taken into play. But the tea house, and you have a, a fantastic Buddhist sculpture that's alive, but that's actually a, it's not a reproduction, but it's a homage, almost 100 years old copy of um, a Nara period, really important sculpture. And then you go and see contemporary work. You see a contemporary digital work, and then you go in and you see contemporary Hosono Hitomi's fantastic thousand leaf bays. And the whole idea of this is to root ourselves now and adjust our eyes and be able to go into the past. The other thing that's really important about this is what is Japan? And this is what you alluded to. What are the definitions of Japan? And we know Japan's an archipelago. It's very related to the cultures around it and indeed globally. So it's not Japan in isolation. It's Japan in dialogue. And these dialogue is taken not just geographically, but also through ownership. So for example, there are fantastic Jomon five fantastic Jomon flame pots. Most of them are from Nagaoka Municipal Museum. They were negotiated in part through the help of Simon Kaner, the Sainsbury Institute, had a very large role to play, and, and I helped with this too. And these fantastic flame pots are there on long-term loan. So it's not just about the British Museum showing off what it has, but it's about um, having dynamic exchanges with groups so ownership can be plural, that the British Museum has a fantastic collection of Japanese uh, objects. There are ceramics alone are 3,500. There are probably 30 something thousand objects. Half of them, half of the overall objects are 2D. The other half are 3D. There's archeology span and it's still, the British Museum still collects. So you have contemporary. So you have everything from ancient to contemporary. So it's a really, quite large, but there are holes. The strengths are Kofun period, their Edo period, their Meiji period, and I would say a good strength now is contemporary craft. So when you're going through what we did with the exhibition objects, and so if there are 30, you know, let's say 33,000 objects, it depends on how you count an object. Do you count a set of objects as one or, you know, 20? So there's a debate on exactly the finessing of the numbers. But saying that, if you, if you look at the whole totality, the number of objects on display in general is about 400 objects. So there are 400 of that whole totality. But happily in the British Museum, there's a real effort to make everything available online with images and with descriptions. And this is an ongoing process. So everything is available and people can write in to see these objects. So the stories are still intact, they've been tweaked. And some of the stories are really, all of the stories are interesting, but some are particularly interesting looking at Japan's continental relationships with Korea, with China. And some stories are the windows in the Edo period outwards from Nagasaki, looking at that. And then also looking at Ainu culture and looking at Okinawa and these pivotal roles that Okinawa and the Ainu played, uh, the Ainu for northern Japan, Okinawa for, for the south, and China and Southeast Asia, Ainu for Russia, for China, for all sorts of different cultural contexts, that everything that brought in as, as showing that Japan is indeed integral and um, quite cosmopolitan. But what we've tried to do, and I think this is quite important, is bring in contemporary Okinawan work, contemporary Ainu work to the displays to show that the Ainu peoples can have their own voice and they should speak for themselves. And the British Museum is one of the first in Europe to do this, particularly with the Ainu, but with Okinawa as well. The stories are quite complicated, but the museum is moving forward in that way. And one of the pieces that I acquired that I'm really delighted about is um, a small but really perfectly formed netsuke by Susan Wright. Netsuke are toggles, kind of male jewelry that were used in the Edo period all the way really to the early Showa period, but now they're collected. Most netsuke 
in fact, are not in Japan. They are in Europe and in Belarus, in, in the Ukraine, you know, all over. They're much loved outside of Japan. So, in fact, there's a bit of a dearth of Netsuke in Japan, just as it was true with earlier with Ukiyo-e before there was a Satogairi or returning. But this Susan Wright Netsuke is really quite important because Susan Wright is British, but she lives in Australia, yet she is a woman, and uh, traditionally Netsuke makers were male, but she is recognized by the Japanese Netsuke Makers Society as a master. And so she's actually overcome all of these boundaries and barriers and her work of this fantastic little frog on a lotus frond is at the very back of the museum, just sitting there in its glory. And it reminds one that nationality, identity, all of these are fluid and need to be constantly re-examined. That's fascinating. And it leads well into the, the next question. As scholars of Japanese culture, you and I are aware that Japan consists of many cultures ranging from regional variations from city to city to distinct cultures with a history largely separate from mainland Japanese, such as Okinawa or the Ainu in Hokkaido, as you mentioned earlier. Is it possible to capture all of this in one gallery space? Absolutely not. <laughs> it isn't. <laughs> no, no, then that's an excellent, Ali, your questions are really so spot on. Um, it isn't, but I don't think the idea is to capture everything. I think the idea is to provoke is to kind of shake up old ideas, is to inspire, is to delight, is to give you a bit of respite and make you want more. The idea that we have of Kaizawa Toru's spectacular sculpture of this wonderful owl, this barn owl that is emerging from the nest that we commissioned for him as the key piece for the Ainu story. It's fantastic. And he got a piece of bog wood <laughs> that um, was, he said, in the bog over a thousand years. And he said, it's like Ainu culture. It's just kind of percolating. <laughs> and then he took it out. He spent a long time. He spent, I guess it was maybe even two years when he was working on this. And we finally got it just in time, like literally just in time to be fumigated and to go through all the processes it needs to go through before it can be displayed. And there it is. Now, does that speak for all of Ainu culture? Um, certainly not. But what it does is it gives an authentic voice, a very important voice. He has a message, and his message is there, really. And one would hope just by looking at it, first of all, you see its fantastic glory, and that makes you think of other resonances, but then it makes you want to know more. It makes you want to look up things. It makes you want to get on that phone and look up Kaizawa Toru, or it makes you want to go to Hokkaido and experience Nibutani, or it makes you at least want to understand, you think, what, who are the Ainu? This doesn't look Japanese. Maybe it is Japanese, but what does this mean? You know, so I think the best that the Japanese galleries can do, and it's three galleries, it's three rooms that are put together, so it's Japanese galleries, but I think that the best that it can do is be provocative, give inspiration. And also, you should never, never underestimate our hectic lives. You know, we feel so harassed, you know, we're always on the phones. And to see an authentic, beautiful, handcrafted piece of work that inspires, that maybe gives a bit of respite, that actually takes you to another place emotionally and kind of readjusts your soul. And I think that that's what the Japanese galleries does. I see. It seems really interesting that in a gallery around the culture of a nation, a big goal seems to be to, to challenge preconceptions of nationalisms and that sort of thing. <laughs> well thought, well put out. I, I believe what you see, and to be honest, it's this is, I'm, you know, I'm going on on dangerous territory here, but there is a move, you know, with many different museums such as Ashmolean and many museums and, and the British Museum to break down these national barriers. So you have mixed content. You might have a Japanese object next to, you know, something Native American next to whatever, you know, all mixed in together or just kind of have this kind of cultural melange to, to break down the ideas of national barriers and boundaries. I think there's a danger in that, in that people don't get the context or, or the understanding, but there's also, it's also good in that it will break down national barriers, but nations are there for a reason. 
and these objects were created for a reason. And it's important to, to kind of understand that, understand at least the context in which they came from. And what is Japan? I mean, if we're looking at the Japanese galleries, I mean, what is Japan really was only Japan as we know it from Meiji era, you know, 1868. Before that, there were many Japans and there were many regional areas. And even today, if you're looking at craft, koge, it's so regional. And that regionalness is enhanced by the government funding schemes, which, you know, encourage regional development and regional expression. There are many reasons for that. We could go into that. But I, I think it's really important to understand that Japan is many things and, you know, incredible um, swaths of cultures. And so it's not just one. But that's the beauty of the Mitsubishi Corporation Japanese galleries, because when you go in, you realize that there is so much there. There's so much going on. It challenges your ideas of cherry blossoms and samurai. It really makes you see that there are many Japans and there are many Japans that are facing Korea, China, Southeast Asia, you know, Europe, you know, India, you know, it, it there, it's, it's all there. So I, I believe it's important to have regional concentrations to actually understand those cultures while constantly adjusting for um, ideas of identity and, and nationality. Yeah, definitely. I've always loved dropping by the Japan Gallery whenever I've been in London in the past, and it's great to hear the, the thought processes that has gone behind its creation. Now, anyone familiar with East Asian studies will most likely have come across the term Orientalism, coined by Edward Said in 1978, which refers to the patronizing attitude of the West towards Middle Eastern, Asian, and North African communities. Museums have historically played a key role in entrenching this attitude, presenting Asian artifacts as a mystical other to contrast against the advanced West. With the turn to decolonization, many institutions are now reconciling with this legacy and working out how to better portray Asian artifacts amongst many other different cultures. Was this something you encountered curating at the British Museum? Well, I think that, interesting enough, the British Museum, well, I'm sure, you know, with repatriation issues, and we can talk about that, but I won't address that right now unless you would like to, the repatriation issues um, aside, I think that the museum is not a fine arts museum, although, you know, it's not like the Metropolitan in New York, it's, which is a fine arts museum, basically, but broadens out. The museum is built on, if you look at its history from Sir Hans Sloan's original gift and the, and the libraries and then what Augustus Wollaston Franks did in the late 19th century, the head curator there, it's, it's really built up on a material culture, libraries, knowledge, learning, and this very much represents the state of learning at that period. I've been obsessed with this man, Augustus Wollaston Franks. Um, he was at the British Museum from 1851 till he retired in 1896 and died the next year. He was never married, so many of his objects came in. And he, at a very early age uh, for collecting in the basically 1872 to 1879, was obsessed with Japan and collected incredible amounts of Japan. And we have his records and, and we see how he's collected. And his collecting practices, which I think reflect the museum even today, we're very much trying to find out what is the authentic culture. So not to go with the flow, not to go with, you know, the bright satsuma wares that were painted and, and glossy that were in the early um, Japanese era, not to go with, you know, a lot with that, but really trying to find out a little bit about what was correct and using Japanese nationals who at that point were at Oxford um, or Cambridge. And uh, we have the letters back and forth, getting their opinions, getting their understanding, working with them and really cross-checking. So there's always been an attempt to be kind of the academic uh, correct version. And there's been a lot of, I don't know, I think there's a lot of thought in that, but saying that it's still white, in general, <laughs> white run, and, and there are amazing lacunas that are sometimes appalling. But I think that the heart is in the right place, and there's constant attempts to relook at itself. The problem is with the British Museum, it's a huge institution. 
I mean, it's really big. <laughs> and um, there are over a thousand people working there. And there is an integrity. The salaries are low. So you get people who love it, who work there because they care. They're not, they're not in there for a job just to, you know, pass the time. They're there for very specific reasons. So everyone's trying to do their best. And what's incredible and what doesn't get seen at the museum is the educational programs. And I just wanted to do a shout out for this because doing the manga exhibition, which I hope we'll talk about in a moment, before that, we always did educational programs, but it's incredible what you see. They do all sorts, you know, for the blind, for the people who cannot hear or vision impaired, for people with autism, you know, all of these different groups, uh, they really focus on how to present the materials for these groups and working with schools, with specific school partnering, particularly with Camden, because that's the, you know, the area that, that the British Museum is in, but other groups as well. So this idea of learning and then the partnerships that the museum has, like, for example, particularly with Asia, now with Manchester. So it's linked with the museum in Manchester and particularly with South Asia because of the large South Asian population there. So it, it's, there is a constant outreach which isn't really seen in the museum and from the average visitor coming into the museum or, for example, their loans. They do some loans and some traveling exhibitions which make money because the museum is free except for special exhibitions and there are a lot of costs that the museum has. But they do free exhibitions or traveling exhibitions to India, to very specific areas, working together with the local groups. And then that reinforms displays in the museum and reinforms the way things are displayed. There are areas that are stagnant, obviously, as any museum, but I feel that there's a spirit to embrace change. One part that has been a bit hard is the repatriation. And I don't really have anything that I could add with that, but I realize that this is hard and it's a harder thing than one would think because the museum has very much governance tied by its very structure to the government, to certain protocols. So it, it can't act independently on many things. And it is a national museum. Unlike in America, there is the Smithsonian Institution, which is perhaps roughly similar, but the museum takes very seriously its role as a national museum. So it's a complicated dance. <laughs> and I, but you can see that there are issues. But I think my instinct is that they are looking for positive solutions. They're trying positive solutions. I think what's needed probably, I mean, I know that there are a lot with Greenpeace and the idea of BP funding and a number of these different funds. The funding is necessary because they don't get very much money from the government. The money that they get is important, but there's not enough inflow coming in that way. And so things have to be subsidized by other ways. I think that what would be helpful is if the public give creative comments for solutions or, or things like that. There's much more of a dialogue. I think the museum would be open to that. And so I think it's still an uh, act in progress, but I know that there are good intentions all around. Yeah, definitely. So let's turn to the 2019 manga exhibition. Japanese pop culture in the form of comics or manga and cartoons or anime have taken younger generations all over the world by storm over the past 30 odd years. In Japan itself, it consists of an enormous subculture with countless volumes filling cafes and bookstores across the country. I have a few questions here on this topic. So first off, where did you begin in selecting manga to include in the exhibition from this enormous amount of content? Yeah. Well, it's really interesting. Um, you know, I, I'm a big manga fan, and I've been always reading manga since I was young. In fact, that's kind of how I learned Japanese. But um, I, uh, I did it as a passion, not as a, as a scholarly study. But what happened is, with the first permanent Japanese galleries, there, Tim kindly put out a manga section, a little manga corner. And so I was able to use my collection <laughs> and put some objects out. We, we put out um, St. Onisan, which is um, St. Young Men, with Buddha and Jesus uh, um, in downtown Tokyo taking a gap year. And uh, we thought this might be racy, but in fact, it was hugely popular and got retweeted and retweeted and retweeted. And this was a long time ago before tweets were, you know, commonplace. And so that kind of immediately clued in people that manga was popular. And uh, in fact, you know, when we put out about TEPCO, the manga about 
TEPCO and what happened uh, with Fukushima, the reactor, and then the meltdown. The, a manga was written ostensibly by someone who was anonymous who had worked a little bit in that. We had an official from TEPCO come and look at it. <laughs> and, um, you know, you realize, you know, the kind of power of putting out a manga, but it was all good and uh, all wonderful. I mean, there were some challenges, but what was really interesting, I took, um, I taught for three years in uh, Bunkashigen uh, Cultural Resource Studies at University of Tokyo from after the galleries were finished the first time till 2008. And while I was there, Neil McGregor, the former director, asked Tim, who then contacted me, to get a manga of the British Museum. So he wanted a manga, and um, it just shows how far thinking he was. So that, that desire came from him. And then I found uh, Hoshino Yukinobu, who I was a big fan of, and he agreed. And so we created um, Professor Munakata's British Museum Adventure. He drew it and translated it, which I translated with Hiromi and Uchida. And this kind of started it off. So we started collecting selectively. But looking back, it depends on how you define manga. But certainly there was manga in the British Museum, contemporarily brought in, in the late 19th, early 20th century. Most of those manga, or early proto-manga, or whatever you want to call them, went to the British Library when there was a separation of objects. And so they are part of the British Library's collection. So there was always a contemporary ephemera collection for those things. And Tim Clark was very interested in print culture. So that aspect was there. But we started collecting selectively. However, this exhibition, we just decided, um, I did a small exhibition in 2015 of three generations. That was Chiba Tetsuya, fantastic, famous sports manga artist. And uh, then uh, Hoshino Yukinobu, his Rain Man series, and Nakamura Hikaru, who did St. Onisan. So we looked at those three generations and we got 100,000 people coming to look at this in room three. So we knew that there was legs. And then I started collecting specifically, but it's hard collecting manga for the British Museum, at least at that point. If they're original drawings, that's one thing. But books, there's whole archival issues about paper. When you collect things like that, they have to be first editions. It's interesting in manga, the first editions in general are not the best because the first edition comes out and then there are corrections. So normally the second or third edition is in general, you know, the kind of the perfect one, although there's a fetishization of, of first editions. And so which one do you collect? You know, anyway, there's all of these issues. So what ended up happening is for this exhibition, which we wanted it to be comprehensive as much as we could, although given that, you know, given the space and given a budget, which wasn't large, we had to borrow and we wanted original drawings. So we borrowed extensively from the artists and most of the objects are owned by the artists and also through the publishers. We selectively commissioned a few works to be made. The most exciting is, um, many were exciting, but in a way, the sensei's his, his real series, he, he created three large drawings of his uh, wheelchair basketball series. And that was, um, in a way, Takiko, that was just, they're spectacular and really, really, really important. But we also commissioned for the museum some interesting manga-esque works. So we have um, fantastic sculptures made by Hosono Hitomi, who did the Thousand Leaf Bays. She also drew manga. So she created a manga in ceramic with this fantastic story of seven sisters. So that's in the museum now as well. Great, really expensive collection then. So, uh, <laughs> I imagine that copyright must have been a nightmare to navigate. Could you share your thoughts on that? Is, is copyrights or other property law a problem you encounter in permanent exhibitions too? Yes, it's, it's, not, it's not a problem, it's just a challenge. It's reasonable. I think that in part because of a Western Orientalist attitude <laughs> towards manga and comics, I mean, this is a big problem. I don't think that attitude is so much in France, per se, but certainly in Britain, the idea of illustrated work, Dickens' illustrations even, saying that, you know, are not thought of as highly as literature. You know, there's just kind of a deep privileging if it's manga, it's comics, it's ephemera, it's not that important. So why are these publishers asking for copyright? I mean, there's just this kind of concept that it's not important from a British sense, although people who know, know. And so, for example, 
Dragon Ball, if we're just looking at that series, that alone is worth perhaps overall the whole franchise, three billion pounds. That's a lot of money. And people, of course, are going to protect their copyright. I mean, it's their bread and butter. It's, it's very, very important. And these manga drawings are artworks. They are specific works. And the drawing is not the manga. The drawing is spectacular. They're called Genga. And then the editor comes in and fixes it and moves it. And then they get made into a printed print culture. So there's almost like two different aspects. There's the drawings and then there's the print. Mm -hmm. So all of that is together. So, so you can understand why copyright is important and what was really challenging. And this is why there haven't been that many <laughs> exhibitions of manga or even anime, which is more complicated, is that you have to get the permissions first from the rights department then that has to go to editorial and then that has to go to the artist. And so you have all of these different stages and then it's not just the permission to use the object, it's how you use the object. And um, I'm just having this issue right now. I'm giving a talk in Heidelberg on the uh, 7th of June and we're making the poster and the Doraemon team at Shogakan kindly allowed us to use the image. And it's just interesting what happens, you know, immediately everyone's idea is the idea to crop. You crop these images to fit them into a really cool, beautiful design, but you can't crop manga. You just absolutely can't. Not the genga, you, you just can't. They are an artwork in and of themselves and the frames are really important. Just concepts like that. But I'd say that copyright was over 50% of the stress and the challenge of that exhibition. <laughs> so to turn to the lighter side, the exhibition was a massive success. Uh, was there anything that surprised you about the demographic of the visitors? Well, I knew that it would be a success, but we didn't have much of a budget to advertise it. So, um, I mean, I knew in my heart it should be a success, but what really delighted me was that it self-advertised, that you get all these vloggers and um, they just <laughs> went for it. And, and it was great. It was really great. And there were demographics that the British Museum weren't used to. It was considered, it's considered one of the best exhibitions in the last 20 years is hitting all of the revenue streams, the demographics. There were a couple of things that, that I thought were amazing, but one asked was Gen Z and millennials came in troves and how they get tickets is different from the traditional British Museum audience that gets tickets months in advance and you pick your day, you know, and you often go into the box office or you, you know, do that. But now everything's online and millennials and particularly Gen Zs tend to do it at the spur of the moment. So they can't forecast the ticket sales that well. I mean, it was just, it was really interesting. It was almost all last moment bookings which was a new thing. And I think it's probably here to stay. But interesting enough for the demographics were that you saw a lot of younger people coming, bringing their grandparents. So you have intergenerational visits. And normally you have the grandparents dragging the grandchild saying, look at the Rosetta Stone. And here, what they're doing now is the grandchildren are, are leading the grandparents and explaining it to them. <laughs> you, know, you could hear in the exhibition explaining to them everything. And that was really, really amazing. The repeat visitors were impressive. And what a lot of memberships were sold because they couldn't get tickets. But if you get a membership, you could come as many times as you want. And one thing we did, which um, there was initially resistance, but, but it was allowed was we made a manga library in the center of the exhibition. So there were bookshelves with manga just stuffed in there and um, English, Japanese, different languages, magazines, and people would sit and read and then they'd get involved. So they'd have to come back to finish their manga. <laughs> and so you'd, you'd have repeated visitors just visiting to read and download. And um, we had download areas. So that was pretty impressive. I think the thing that really impressed me the most though was the group's for the visually impaired and the blind, the groups that came. And I was lucky to be with two groups, but they did it a number of times and it was fantastic. I, I thought, how are we going to do this and make it a really good experience? There was no problem. It was excellent. The museum knew exactly how to do this. The visitors loved it. And then they, even though you would think manga is completely visual, 
no. They had a storyteller there who described it. And we had some Braille and some different experiences. And it opened my eyes and made me realize that I need to really rethink this. What manga is, is a multi-sensory experience, an immersive storytelling. And um, the museum got it. And the visitors did too. And uh, I think that's maybe perhaps part of its lasting legacy. That's fantastic. Thank you for answering my questions, Nicole. Before we finish the episode, could you share with us what other projects you're currently working on? Oh, of course. Of course. I've got a couple of things brewing. Um, my passion is koge, so I'm still trying to think how I'm going to work forward on this. I, what I really want to do is bring a few young artists to the UK and do some interactive exhibitions and displays with them really on process because what's so exciting about koge is that you know you have a completed beautiful object but the path is in the process it's how they made it it's the stages that they go through and when you understand that the object has so much more meaning and you can get so much more enjoyment out of it so i'm hoping to do more podcasts more kind of online content and kind of capture this so that's one thing that um, I'd like to work with, particularly with Uchida Hiromi, but more topically what I'm doing now is I'm giving this talk at Heidelberg on the 7th of June called The Accidental Translator, but looking really at, at translation of manga and um, translation, I, I'm interested in different forms and how, how it gets out there. So I'm working also with um, Shueisha, a big publishing company, a fantastic publishing company that is probably the most important, well, with Kodansha and Shogakan, most important with manga translation. And they've got a really interesting program called Shueisha Art Heritage Program, which looks at Genga drawings that they have, that they've published. And these are the original drawings and they've digitally captured them. And they're looking at different ways of making these accessible and for people to purchase, but also to understand the processes. So it's very much linking what I'd like to do with Kolge, with craft, but also looking at the craft of manga, the printing presses, the different editorial processes. It's, it's actually quite similar. These are objects that can be singular, but that it can also be mass produced. So looking at the resonances between those two is a big passion. And I'm mulling um, trying to do um, something else with anime. So um, watch this space, Ali. Maybe I can be invited back um, in the future <laughs> for another podcast. Yeah, well, you're welcome back anytime. Thanks, Nicole. It's been a real pleasure. Oh, well, thank you, Ali. I really enjoyed your questions and I hope I didn't go on too much. <laughs> You can find a link to Nicole's research profile in the description below. Next week, we will be joined by Professor Fabio Rambelli, lecturer at the University of California's Department of East Asian Languages and Cultural Studies, as well as International Shinto Foundation Chair in Shinto Studies, to discuss gagaku, a traditional form of Japanese music which has endured to the modern day largely unchanged over a thousand years. I'll be asking Fabio about the cultural significance of court music in modern Japan, who played it and why, and the global interest in Buddhist culture, both tangible and intangible. We hope you'll join us then. Thank you for listening. <laughs>